Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yo, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Matt, that's great. We're here another week and I'm looking out my office windows here at the Mistake Zone HQ. And Matt, mm-hmm. tis the season, Christmas season. And I was wondering, when it comes to Christmas decorations, how how's your take on Christmas decorating? Do you like to partake in it or do you kind of like to enjoy the hard work of other people from afar? Oh, Jaren, I, I very much enjoy looking at other people's hard work and yes. uh, thinking, man, that looks really nice. Matt, I should do that. But, uh, you know, that takes more work than I, I want to put forward. What's your take on the giant 15 feet or however tall, whether it be during the Halloween season with the giant skeletons or <laughs> the winter season with the giant Santa Clauses? What is your take on these huge quote-unquote monstrosities i like the giant skeletons i don't think jaren i've ever seen anything that's giant that's that size for christmas though that's also not a blow-up kind of a situation oh i think all the santas in our neighborhood aka the two of them (laughs) um when we see them on our evening walk with our dog it is of the inflatable variety and oh, true. Matt, mm-hmm. I, I think this is a discussion we've been having here in the Mistake Zone HQ for a few weeks now where we like the idea of Christmas decorations, of Halloween decorations. But mm-hmm. I think for, you know, the decoration aspect, at least for me, it's I want not only do I want to enjoy it, but I want people around us to enjoy it if that makes sense where mm-hmm. i'm not necessarily doing it for myself but for passersby onlookers but we live in an area where we don't get much foot traffic we don't get much car traffic so matt i feel like that's mm-hmm. a wasted effort on our part however mm-hmm. if we go on our, the our walks people are into it and i enjoy that i appreciate it but at the same time i long for Should I do this? Should I not do this? But Matt, as you said, it's effort. It's Mm -hmm, effort. mm -hmm. Plus, once the season, you know, finishes and all those decorations have to go in storage, Uh Matt, Uh that's just wasted space. Wasted space I can put more anime figures in. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. this past Halloween season, there was this one Halloween decoration that I was really into. And I'm not sure if you saw it, Matt. But Mm -hmm. it was essentially these planters that were like little the size of a child i guess okay and they were skeletons and the the head was an area where you can put like a jack-o'-lantern or a pumpkin in uh-huh. where i think though something like that would be something i would put in the mistake zone hq office and use as a planter for the whole year but that was the <laughs> only time i was really considering getting something for our to decorate but as i said a few weeks ago matt no kids to the neighborhood so it would have been lost on anyone but me (laughs) jared that sounds like the adult version of a chia pet yeah i I guess so i guess so matt matt Mm -hmm. also speaking about halloween Mm -hmm. now that i just got reminded i we were walking our dog a few weeks ago you know when halloween ended Mm -hmm. and our neighbor was throwing out their pumpkins you know they left it at the curb waiting for um the yard waste people to come pick it up Mm -hmm. and i remember looking at the pumpkins that they laid out and thought oh weird where is the bright blue pumpkin and the pumpkin with the blink 182 logo did someone just come and take their pumpkins the pumpkins that they're throwing out and that Uh it dawned on me Uh the blue pumpkin that they painted and the jack-o'-lantern with the blink 182 logo Mm -hmm. that was from 2022 Uh and that uh-huh. I had an existential breakdown of considering what time was, uh-huh. and I wanted to cry during that dog walk. Yeah. But my <laughs> my insecurities about time and getting older aside, Matt, mm-hmm. how have you been doing, man? What have you been up to this week? Jaren, 
honestly, this week I have been far more than I ever thought I would diving deep into Fortnite. All right. Mm-hmm. That, that's my wheelhouse. <laughs> I love me some Fortnite, some fork and knife, uh-huh. if you will. But Jared, Jared, not real fork, not real fork. Of knife, course, because you know that's not that's not what I'm about. You know, ever since you dropped the hey crouch speed, uh, crouch move speed is slower. You know, Jared, I just wasn't that into it. Matt, mm-hmm. uh, I've been playing a bit more Battle Royale since last week. Still not a fan of a lot of the changes, but. It's been a long time. Matt, I finally got my first dub in a while. And nice. it felt really good. Matt, not a bot game. Not a bot game, which also made nice, me feel nice, well. Nice, nice. And a little inside baseball for the Mr. Egg Zone HQ. When we usually play Fortnite, um, we play with our friend. And she's hyper aggressive. Matt, okay. mm-hmm. you know me. Uh-huh. I'm not aggressive when it comes to battle royales. I like to play the perimeter game. Mm-hmm. I like to uh, third party where I can, and if I'm going all the way to the end, I want to. I, I want to wait it out. Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can understand that's totally boring play, but uh, our aggressive friend, she unfortunately uh, found herself in a situation where it was three on one. Uh, she died i picked up her card and was waiting for the right time to revive her matt Mm -hmm. i could only see her because when someone spectates you in Fortnite, you'll have like the eyeball icon in the corner that means they're spectating you Mm -hmm. and towards the end of the game when we were just kind of camping out you know hearing everyone fight around us i could see our friend just switching perspective constantly between us Uh where man Matt, as someone who is probably is really aggressive to watch turtle play especially my turtle play must be (laughs) Uh a thrilling thrilling time but matt Mm -hmm. that aside Mm -hmm. as i said last week fortnite has introduced a lot of modes to go live um that includes lego fortnite rocket racing and fortnite festival Mm -hmm. and as you said matt you aren't playing quote-unquote traditional fortnite but at the end of the day at least for now i think this is what fortnite is i know everyone is talking about how they're chasing that roblox engagement that roblox money but at the same time i'm i find this period really interesting and it will be really telling for the future of how much these three modes will continue to get additional support additional Mm -hmm. um content and you know paid microtransactions but for since the launch of all these three modes we've been seeing the headlines that fortnite has been seeing some crazy um concurrent users i always found it fascinating that when you log into you know the fortnite and you look in the lobby you can see how many people are playing in which mode and Mm -hmm. i don't know about you matt but lego fortnite every time i've logged on since it's a launch it's had at least a million people always playing it Mm -hmm. i think rocket racing hovers around 200k to 400k uh, and then with festival, I've seen it around 300k to 500k. So these are some pretty serious numbers, mm-hmm. and it, it's still early on for all of them. That I'm really curious to see how they continue to flush out everything. But Matt, mm-hmm. as someone jumping into new Fortnite, which mode has? Uh, h- how should we tackle this, Matt? Uh, are your least favorite to most favorite of the new modes, or I don't know w- which one do you want to talk about first? Jaren, for me, I don't think it matters too much which we talk about first, but I feel like just because it's us, we should probably talk about Fortnite Festival last. Right. <laughs> because we're always, we'll, we'll always be harmonics, but Matt, I'm just, mm-hmm. just going to say it. I've played a lot of Rocket Racing this week, mostly because yeah. to unlock a character skin, you have to be in gold rank, which I think oh, I, I think see. I'm in silver right now. Okay, uh, I I still have a long ways to go, but of the three modes I played, Matt, I think my relationship with Rocket Racing is the weakest. Where yes. I think once I get the character in question, I. I probably won't touch this mode just because in terms of feel, Matt, this is going to sound really, oh man, 
I don't want this to sound as harsh as maybe this will come, but of the three modes, this one feels the most like it it was a user created map for, you know, the Fortnite creative mode. I see. Or, you know, the Unreal Engine Fortnite experience, the UEFN. Mm-hmm. And I know this is made by Psyonix, you know, the Rocket League devs, but mm-hmm. I played my fair share of Rocket League back in the day. And as much as there is some similarities between the two handle wise, I I feel like Rocket Racing is the roughest of like the three new modes. I don't mm-hmm. necessarily like how it feels. I think in terms of vision again, this is kind of hard for me to explain to people who haven't necessarily played a lot of Fortnite creative maps and that. Mm -hmm. As someone who played a lot of Fortnite creative maps to kind of get creator XP for various quests, trying to AFK stuff and whatnot, um, there's this level of, I don't know, like not necessarily a lack of polish. Again, you know, I know the team over there most likely worked really hard on this product and what they integrated into the Fortnite platform in itself. I just think that it isn't, this feels like the most early access of the three new modes to me. Uh, and I don't know, I'm not really feeling how it controls. Maybe it's just because I come from a lot of Mario Kart and that's where my basis of <laughs> uh-huh, you know arcade uh-huh. races comes from, from Mario Kart, Hot Wheels, and even, you know, Cruise and Blast or whatever came out on the Switch. But um, yeah, in terms of mechanics, I feel like the drifting isn't really satisfying. Uh, some of the courses, especially some of the early courses, I feel like mm-hmm. when they include the lava uh, environmental hazards um, on the track itself, I don't think that looks great either, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it kind of sticks out in a really, really weird way. Yeah, where I think it's just not all there for me, where I typically like a good arcade racer and... When I was playing this, all I thought was, oh, man, I should have probably just bought a bunch of, when I was really into Rocket League, bought a bunch Mm -hmm. of those Fast and Furious cars, and maybe those would be accessible here. But yeah, I I don't know. I feel like I'm playing it for obligation right now, uh, just to get kind of that skin. Uh, But yeah, Matt, in terms of your time with Rocket Racing, how are you feeling with it? I mean, Jaren, I like the way that it handles. I think for Mm -hmm. me, kind of like you, the... The weirdest part for me is the drift, just because I am I know that I'm not supposed to, but I'm habitually doing the kind of waggle for the drift. Right, right, right. And it's just wasting my drift uh, sometimes. But I kind of agree that of the three new modes, this is probably, this is probably like one of the less polished ones. But I, I kind of, okay, so Jaren, I... I'm still kind of just like hovering around bronze, like like high bronze right now. Because yeah. I finally hit that point where I wasn't winning every round. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll stop for tonight. And then I never went yeah. back in. And does it get a lot more complicated on the later maps or no? Because I feel like my big kind of like issue with Rocket Racing right now is that it feels samey in a way that doesn't feel good. I know for where I'm at right now, maybe it's just because what the map rotation has been giving me, but I've only been playing like a lot of the introductory, um, Mm. you know, when you pick a map, especially for your private races, you can, there's, I think different port or uh, quote unquote difficulty levels for maps. And so far I've only been getting that first row of maps. Um, So I'm not sure if that might be a weekly rotation thing or a current uh maybe it is divided into the different um cla- or ranks you're in but yeah so far i've been only getting the tutorial um maps which you know are pretty basic maybe when i start to play some of the more advanced uh classes where you know shortcuts are available to you depending on how you boost or how you jump maybe that's mm-hmm. when the track um feel will be pretty good yeah but for the most part right now it is kind of your basic loops with a few turns here some environmental hazards here but nothing too crazy uh and maybe that's where my um you know why i'm kind of souring in it just because it is the introductory map so maybe Mm -hmm. it's not Mm -hmm. something that i want to get out of 
a arcade racer right now but um yeah hopefully uh, i can report back when i play some of the new maps but again it's not really leaving a lasting impression for me as well but uh anything else you thought of rocket racing that i don't know like i think it has a lot of potential for it to be really mm-hmm. fun like just the fact that they have the kind of you know sticking on walls sticking on ceilings you're kind of like boosting and like you said you're timing your boosts in a correct way once you like know where you're supposed to be doing it in maps yeah but i do think that um rocket racing has like a lot of potential for me i think i am going to keep picking at it um and i'm going to just keep hoping that it it'll finally like really really click for me at some point right yeah, I understand that this is, again, these modes have just been introduced. I'm sure uh, all the teams will be working on it, especially given the reception each one of them seems to be getting as well, where, uh, as I said, I do like me a good arcade racer, so it is something I'll be keeping my eye on. But mm-hmm. I think for now, it's I'm just looking forward till it gets a lot more polished. But Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about polished, I feel like we should talk about you know, the one that's the most polished of the three, and that's Lego Fortnite. Yes. Where I, when I first mentioned this to you, Matt, I was saying, oh, this is Fortnite and Lego's take on Minecraft. But I think now after getting my hands on it, playing with by myself and playing with friends, um, I feel like the Minecraft comparison is a bit unfair. Yeah. Where... This is more so a survival crafting game rather than Mm -hmm. their take on Minecraft, where there's a lot of good things about Lego Fortnite, some of the mechanics that they're, you know, delivering to the user. And Matt, uh, again, Mm -hmm. of the three, this one seems like the most polished, where during my time playing through it, I thought the fact that this is free to you know just download and play right off the bat Mm -hmm. is wild to me matt where if i was a kid now this would be my everything yeah definitely yeah but i think where i'm coming from as well is i played my fair share of minecraft back in the day Mm -hmm. and I think this especially came out when I was playing the creative mode, just because there are two modes. There's the survival mode, and then there's the creative mode, which, you Mm -hmm. know, takes out hunger, stamina, death, you know, losing your stuff on death. And I think I'm so used to the quote-unquote freedom of Minecraft when it comes to developing your area. Yeah. Um, Kind of, you know, that being in first person and having you know the block logic in minecraft has become so ingrained to me where going into lego fortnite and trying to build um your way there you would think that oh since this is lego this should kind of play like minecraft but yeah it also has that lego logic to it where matt remember or you know in minecraft say i build up i build like a little tower Mm -hmm. I extend uh, horizontally and then I destroy all the vertical blocks that were quote unquote holding it up. And then my blocks Uh still float. And then Mm -hmm. in first person, I'm able to, you know, hold down shift, um, you know, hug the ledge and then start building that way. Mm -hmm. In Lego Fortnite, you have that Lego logic of, oh, I took out the support the vertical support beams well everything horizontal is just going to fall to the ground (laughs) oh i can't like you know if i have a a floor i want to put it side by side with the floor i sit down wait no since i don't have a supporting beam i have to layer it on top of my floor like actual Mm -hmm. lego so Mm -hmm. i'm doing a little steep um you know that gradually floors that gradually go upwards and oh wait there's no supporting there so it's just going to topple over because it's all lopsided in weight where Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. i understand it's a lego but again it's it's hard for me to separate my experience with a fortnite of why doesn't this work like fortnite works Uh and that that's what's kind of get i know that's unfair but that's what's getting to me the most there but i think my time with 
my friends playing through this actual survivor like treating it less like minecraft and more like a survival game i think that's where it really shines i know we went through a random cave we discovered we fought a Mm -hmm. boss at the end and i think yeah when you separate it from your preconceived notions of it being a minecraft um competitor and more so hey this is you're literally playing lego in this world i think it becomes a lot more enjoyable but Mm -hmm. matt how has your time been with lego fortnite my time has been very similar i think going into it at the beginning i also was thinking oh this is going to be lego minecraft but then slowly coming to that realization of oh this is yeah like you said survival lego survival game Mm -hmm. and once i got to the point of the lego survival game i started appreciating it more or kind of like, I guess, playing it the way that it's meant to be played instead of playing it the way that I conceived in my head that it should be played. And I was having a lot more kind of fun with it. I I, I don't like how the building feels in this game. No, I I especially don't like how the building feels. Which is a huge shame considering that it's Lego. I feel like Mm -hmm. the pieces don't stick together very, like, well. I don't like that i don't like that the fact that they made it so that you're supposed to place pillars between everything to get them to line up with the um foundations i i thought that was like really that felt really bad i don't like that the foundations don't just have a basic two by two unless i just haven't unlocked that uh yet but i don't know the building leaves a lot to be desired for me and i feel like I shouldn't feel that way with a Lego product. No, I totally know what you mean, where I was actually shocked at how it felt. And Mm -hmm. I think one of my biggest gripes is, again, I know this is unfair of me that that I keep going back to Minecraft, but every time I've played Minecraft, say I wanted to make my central village. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's, okay, I'm going to get this layer large scale area i'm going to break it down so everything's leveled so i can build a town there Mm -hmm. and i feel like a lot of the time my early time with lego fortnite is trying to find a suitable location that's just flat for Mm -hmm. me to build a bit like start my town start my main village and i think the lack of i'm not even sure if it's in the game but a lot of terraforming is what was also really souring me on Lego Fortnite, just because it's so hard to line up things. I don't like a lot of the different foundation bricks. I don't like how these sit on like the terrain as Mm -hmm. well, where it's also with Minecraft, you have that unified block looking feel, but with Lego Fortnite, it is, oh, this, you know, realistic, you know, you have realistic quote unquote looking trees, ground, terrain, and then you're building Lego bricks on top of it, which would make sense or which would be fine. But it's the fact that I want everything to be flat. So now I have random foundation bricks just clipping in and out of the terrain, which also Mm -hmm. kind of looks weird to me where I would hope that eventually it would come to, there would be some sort of, nice terraforming uh and some you know just quality of life things when it comes to managing your village but again uh i'm really nitpicking it but i i can't stress this enough matt but the fact that it's just a free-to-play game that you can go at Mm -hmm. it and it has some you know it has a really solid foundation and of the three extra Fortnite modes i feel like this one will all will get a lot of support especially considering the lego you know collaboration the lego Mm tie-in the lego branding which i'm really excited just to see what they're able to do jared have they said at all what the like other than it being lego um fortnite like have they said they're bringing in any like sets or anything not yet but i know with some of the data mine stuff there was hints of what's their ninja Lego set or Ninjago, universe? I want to say. Yeah, Ninjago. I think there was like hints of Ninjago stuff there. So I think that would be kind of cool with every new Fortnite season or even Lego Fortnite season is hey, we're going to introduce this set. We're going to not only will they be cosmetics for you to buy, but also here is some new pieces for you to play with. Just because 
I think of the three modes, the Lego Fortnite one, um, it seems like its monetization will be through the skins, which you can buy and like use towards all the other modes, where Lego Fortnite doesn't seem to have its own battle pass. It doesn't have any specific um, monetization uh, avenues compared to all the other Fortnite modes. So I'm really curious to see how they introduce new content and what kind of world events that they'll bring to it as well. Jaren, I really, really hope that <laughs> they bring in Bionicle into Lego uh, Fortnite. Of course, Matt. Of course. I think that's the end goal for oh, us millennial boomers at this point for sure. them to have Bionicle and like skins oh. for your character. Jaren, they can they can pair it up with uh Fortnite Festival when they bring in the eventual I'm hoping the eventual all American rejects uh a pass. Oh man. I think no, that that's no, there is an all American rejects song here. Oh, I'm not there? sure if you can purchase it yet. I think Dirty Little Secret will eventually oh, right. uh, yes, come into yes, it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But Matt, yeah, so before we move on to festival, but yeah, Lego Fortnite, again, the most polished of the three. It, I think uh, if you're, you have a younger sibling or a younger mm-hmm. cousin or child, I think this is definitely something that can be really a good bonding experience for you to kind of experience. And of course, I'm really excited just to see what's coming to it. But again, I think you need to go into it thinking it is a survival game and less of a minecraft like Mm -hmm. um i i wish the building was kind of tighter uh and i'm I'm hoping that there is just a lot of quality of life things in the future maybe like a first person mode Mm -hmm. specifically Mm -hmm. just to help with the building and for you to be precise but for now um I enjoyed my time, but it's something that, again, kind of like rocket racing, I'm waiting to see what updates come to it um, Mm. just for it to be fleshed out a bit more. Uh Also, Jaren, I feel like I kind of just want to say that even though it is kind of basic, I feel like the combat in Lego Fortnite is a lot better than I ever would have expected it to be. Matt, that dodge is lit. That dodge (laughs) is really really good. Oh, man, that's such a good dodge. I... I know early on, a few friends and I were just going around attacking wolves and spiders and whatever those crab-like underground things are Mm -hmm, and just mm -hmm. dodging, you know, just dodging circles around them and thinking, man, if they added world bosses, (laughs) pretty good, Matt, pretty good. Oh, man. I'm going to tell my kids that this was the Dark Souls (laughs) of uh, Fortnite. Oh, man. Jaren, I bet that if, like, they're able to do the kind of um, user-created stuff, there's going to be a Lego Dark Souls in like a year of that coming out. I can't wait. I can't wait, Matt. So we saved, uh, I think, our personal bias for last, Matt. Uh-huh. And now we have to talk about Fortnite Festival uh-huh. made by Harmonix, a studio that, you know, is near and dear to our hearts, given our, you know, respective histories with the studio uh-huh. and the games that they've developed over the past, what, decades that yes. we've been playing video games uh since the playstation 2 shout out to frequency amplitude rock band guitar hero um and now we're here with arguably the spiritual successor to rock band mm-hmm. uh in lego not lego fortnite festival mm-hmm. um fortnite festival is divided into two modes you have your main stage which is your traditional rhythm game and then you have the jam stage which not surprisingly this is also the spiritual successor to Fuser in a weird way. Where... Oh, wait, I don't think I did this part. I think I was always just doing the rock band stuff. So, Matt, uh-huh. if you're really interested in the festival pass, my hot tip is go into the jam th- uh, stage. Go to any, any one of the places you can put down a loop and just let it sit for 30 minutes a day, you'll be you'll max out the battle or the festival pass by the end of it. This guy. If you want at least the free stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, to kind of tell you more about the jam stage, it's you go into this big area and there are multiple stages. It's this big open hub. And in this hub, there are different stages that you can jump on. And when you jump on a stage, you're able to drop down a loop. And loops kind of correspond with the in-game tracks or the jam packs that you can purchase or receive for free um 
and essentially with the jam or with the loops you can place down the lead instrument stem the vocal stem the bass stem and then the or the drum stem Mm -hmm. and similar to fuser you're putting down a stem and whoever joins you can put down their stem and then you can all change the key of the song and you're essentially mashing up songs with different drum beats different bass lines different vocals different lead instruments similar to what you were doing in fuser where it isn't it's so it's kind of like this little jam session and I think from a kind of harmonics history standpoint, the fact that they not only brought, you know, the spiritual successor to rock band, but also Fuser into a Fortnite festival is Uh kind of wild to me, Matt. And again, it's the, the idea is you go into the jam stage, uh, you start remixing songs based on all the tracks you have, but in reality, it's people just kind of AFKing there to get their 30 minutes of jam stage every day for their like festival pass XP. Mm-hmm. But the main, you know, meat and potatoes for us is the main stage. And this is your traditional note highway. Uh, depending on your difficulty level, you have four or five notes that you can hit. Mm-hmm. There's overdrive, your star power, and Matt. Mm-hmm. playing through main stage of Fortnite festival two things come to mind uh-huh one i think i would uh if the whole apple and google lawsuits didn't happen i think i would enjoy this a lot more because my sick and twisted brain it has been corrupted by bang dream project sekai and g4dj where uh-huh not uh-huh i think Fortnite festival its default controller controls are bad so i have to play on a keyboard and matt if i'm not touching tapping a screen my brain goes to mush yeah jaren i for some reason just cannot follow this note highway with mm-hmm. regards to assigning it to keys yes i don't know like something about it is just messing me up where i don't know it doesn't make sense to me like i'm fine with a lot of the rhythm games i play on steam that i use my keyboard for but Mm -hmm. there's something about playing through festival where i was just deep down i was like man if this was on the ios or the android i thought this would be really fun i i was trying to look through it because i wanted to plug in my fight stick and Mm -hmm. think oh maybe this could be cool on a fight stick but again I don't. I couldn't find where you would remap your controller bindings. I can find the key oh. bindings, editing, but not for the controller. So it's, I it's guess... in the controller like menu. You just have to scroll yeah. down because it's like okay. at the very bottom. There's a separate thing for like uh, easy to hard, and then like a part for X. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll take a look at that and like plug in my fight stick to see. But Matt, uh huh. As longtime rock band boys, how's yes. uh? Festival is treating you. Jaren, I, I I don't like festival. <laughs> oh no. Matt, Matt uh-huh. are you w- will you like it? Because in 2024, since Epic said that supporting rock band instruments is one of their priorities. Yes, Jaren, I I don't like festival right now because it's not supporting these <laughs> dumb instruments that I spent <laughs> like yeah. 40 minutes finding and finding batteries for. And yeah. hooking up and remapping my controls for it. And I don't know. Jaren, something about it just makes it... Because um, I was able to get the um, My Guitar Hero controller hooked up and mapped correctly. Yeah. Jaren, that game is, is so hard <laughs> if, you're, if you can't use a strum bar. Yes, yes. Where... So yesterday when I was like doing a session, I was specifically playing uh, Vampire by Olivia Rodrigo, uh, Mm -hmm. The Weekends Take My Breath, and Kendrick Lamar's Eye, Mm -hmm. where their note charts, for the most part, if I was playing on a guitar with a strum, I think those would be pretty easy. Yeah. But as someone playing even on medium and just kind of tapping along, like some of those note charts are incomprehensible Mm -hmm. without like strumming to me for some reason. Mm -hmm. Or even I think I would have had an easier time if it was on, um, you know, a touch screen device. Yes. Where because I've been corrupted by 
again, Bang Dream, where I just can't comprehend the note chart. And it's it's always the ego hit with me, Matt, where I have to dial it down to easy just so I <laughs> understand what I'm doing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But it, it's all there. What I do like is where it it is kind of rough around some edges, but I think from a production standpoint, uh, I really enjoy what it is. Like, I mm-hmm. think the main menu hub, again, you know, you load into this menu hub, you select your set list, and then you load into the actual rhythm game part. Mm-hmm. I think that main menu hub, again, has that, oh, this feels like a user-created map jank that I'm kind of used to. But once you load into the game... Uh, I think that's where it starts to have that same charm that Rock Band has with me. Mm-hmm. Where Matt, mm-hmm. that introduction of you all flying through the oh, portal man. So and good. you do a sick pose with your bandmates. I think that's the coolest thing. Mm-hmm. I like how if your instrument has downtime, you're able to emote. Uh-huh. I think that's also a neat touch as well, where there's all these little things that they're doing, but... At the same time, I think the actual rhythm gameplay is something that um, is taking me a bit to get used to because, once again, I'm trying to adapt to the controls. And Mm -hmm. two, that Mm -hmm. I told you before with Rock Band or with Bang Dream, with Project Sekai, with D4DJ, I'm playing. I think the longest song I'll ever play is like up to words three minutes, unless I'm playing a full song. But again, having to play through four or five, six minute songs, it's reminding me of, oh, right, this is the Uh rhythm game investment that I forgot about. But yeah, Matt, I think it has a lot of potential, mostly because I am coming from that, you know, I love me some harmonics. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I just want the to see how it feels with the instrument implementation to see if this really becomes the rock band we are more acquainted with. But. Yeah, I'm really, really interested in seeing what happens on the keyboard side after mm. uh, the implementation or like the um, instrument peripheral implementation happens. Because yes. I think the thing that I would really, really want is a keyboard strum bar, if that makes sense to you. Mm. Like... Like you said, when you're playing um, these these songs, I guess like for the guitar charts in general, hitting all those chords kind of back to back in sync and all that is really what made it uh, kind of like difficult for me. Yeah. And Same. I think having the strum bar equivalent, even on the keyboard, would be such a huge boon to the game that would make it feel so much better. Right. And I'm also really interested in seeing if they're going to switch the expert drums layout or even i guess like the the any any of the drums layout because like how of the bass pedal is basically mapped to the leftmost um track bar i don't know yeah. what, which word to use here um and jaron i got to say i was honestly surprised that the singing um game was exactly the same when I loaded that up, I was honestly expecting it to be Trombone Hero. So mm. to see that it was exactly the same as the other ones makes sense in retrospect. But I guess like looking at it from the Rock Band perspective, I really was just expecting something else. Yeah. Where I know that I'm really just curious to see how they implement the instruments just because, mm-hmm. again, I think this becomes a different game if you have instrument support. So having to kind of balance that as well will be also a interesting task. But for the most part, Matt, this, again, with all these Fortnite experiences, Mm -hmm. it becomes a a waiting and see where they go from here, where I think they're all off to really promising starts, um, you know, in varying states of polish. But at the same time, I want to see where it goes from here, uh, how they continue to be supported um and man i think before we leave the topic i just need to talk about something that is kind of you know circling the community right now and it Mm -hmm. is the prices of the current cosmetics where you know you have a lot of people bewildered by oh a rocket racing car 
you know, some of them are $20, 30 $40. Oh, damn. Uh, the festival pass is 1800 essentially 18 USD. Uh, that gets you, the premium track gets you four songs and then the weekend skin and some int- like instrument skins as well. Where I think coming from a rock band background, I'm a bit, I'm not surprised at the pricing for um, the DLC not the DLC, like the songs, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, you know me, man, I don't want to like defend microtransactions, but I think it kind of makes sense given our history with Rock Band to me. But as someone who might just be a Fortnite exclusive player, I think some of the prices are a bit jarring. I think the Rocket League uh, Racing cosmetic prices is really jarring. Um, I think with the you know, the track packs for festival. I know they're working on making them lobby music in the future, but the fact that, you know, you can't buy a song and just make that lobby music right now is also uh, a little weird. Mm. Um, I know you can use them as emotes in games, but those kind of work as they do in the jam, um, the jam stage where you're just playing that stem depending on which one you select and you need people to, you know, join you with their own stems. It isn't like the Metallica master of puppets emote or a lot of the different sync emotes where you started off and people are able to join in and emote with you. But maybe if you fix that up, I can, I don't want to say 500 V bucks per song is a good price, Uh but considering that this gets you a festival note chart, um, this gives you a jam stage, you know, fuser note thing, uh, background music and potential emote if they fix it. I think that's where the value comes in. But then again, I'm the guy who paid two dollars for a DLC song in Rock Band and has a buttload of Rock Band DLC. So who am I to talk? <laughs> uh-huh. But yeah, I'm curious to see how they'll the cosmetics for everything moving forward, just because I find even like the skins for your instruments are really expensive on their own, but we'll, we'll see how that kind of shakes out. But yeah, I guess my verdict right now for the Fortnite modes is that there are varying degrees of polish, but I'm really curious to see where they go on from here. Mm-hmm. Um, any final thoughts from you, Matt? Jaren, I, okay. I don't know if I just like overlooked something, but, do they change what songs are available depending on what time it is? Uh, I think there's a daily rotation of what songs are free. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, that makes more sense to me. Because I was wondering yeah. why, like, oh, I was able to play, like, what was it, Seven Nation Army at one point, and then the next time I played, it wasn't there anymore. I yeah, so was, yeah. with the main stage for Fortnite Festival, yeah, there's a daily rotation of songs. And if you want to kind of play it off rotation, you have to you know pay five hundred mm-hmm. V bucks for it. Yeah, man, Jaren, can I be honest with you? <laughs> yep. After I uh, finished messing around in Fortnite Festival, I ended up just getting Clone Hero and started playing with my my instruments on there. Oh, how, how's Clone Hero doing uh, in December twenty twenty three? Jaren, Clone Hero is really good. It it feels really good. It feels like uh, it feels like Guitar Hero. I. Jaren, I totally forgot that um, Guitar Hero has the open strum for bass. Yeah. And when that showed yeah, up, yeah. I got so thrown off. Um, Jaren, I'm still really, really bad at drumming. I don't know how to control my arms properly. And my like stomach hurts from using the foot pedal. Of course. And Jaren, all I did was just play Hollow Life songs. <laughs> Matt, you ever think it's weird that epic's looking into rock band control this sport considering no one's making new rock band instruments and probably the people who really want the support is a really niche audience i mean yeah it, it is really weird but like i guess it really does depend on how well fortnite festival does mm-hmm. and ho- hopefully because of the three modes again this is the one that where we have the most history with quote unquote, and I, mm-hmm. I do want the best for it and harmonic. So hopefully it, it gets to the point, but Matt, mm-hmm. you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> she was in fall guys. 
I'm just waiting for the Hatsune Miku collab. And Jaren, you just got to come to Clone Hero, man. <laughs> That's true, Matt. But but Matt, uh-huh. I need that Hatsune Miku skin so I can go into uh, Fortnite Battle Royale and do sweet, sweet kills with an AR oh, man. with Miku. But until then, Matt, at least we have the weekend. Mm-hmm. So, Matt. Mm-hmm. Speaking about things we grew up with, I feel like in the mistake zone, I need to mention the latest Studio Ghibli movie, uh, the latest from Hayao Miyazaki in that this week, The Boy and the Heron. Well, I guess it came out in July, but in terms of a wider theatrical release, uh, The Boy and the Heron has come out, is more readily available for consuming, Mm -hmm. and I think as someone who did a lot of the quote-unquote Ghibli Fest 2023, where uh, we watched a uh, new, not new, but we watched a previous Miyazaki movie, Studio Ghibli movie, um, throughout the year to end up with the latest release, The Boy and the Heron, I think was a good way to tie up uh, just all the different material that we consumed this year. And The Boy and the Heron being the latest from the studio i matt Mm -hmm. i feel like with a lot of ghibli films it is for me personally and i hope this isn't a wild take but i more so go in for the animation the visuals that whimsical feeling where Mm -hmm. i think a lot of the times story wise i usually put in the back burner and kind of just go into a Ghibli film to just experience what it has to offer. Um, All the visuals, all the productions and the boy in the heron is no Uh different Matt where it is, it clocks in at around just over two hours by a bit. And it is a visual spectacle that you've come to expect from Miyazaki from studio Ghibli Mm -hmm. where the thing I really appreciated from The Boy and the Heron is that it still subscribes to that, you know, kind of... How do how would you explain the Ghibli style, Matt? It's something that feels... I don't want to say dated in a way, but it really reminds me of those retro anime sensibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, it... You know, a lot of their films take place in, I think, in terms of the time period, a lot of it focuses around that, you know, post-World War II era, you know, late 40s, early 50s, uh, a lot of country or Japan countryside, you know, so- something like along those lines. And The Boy and the Heron is no different. Mm-hmm. It still follows that time period. Uh, it still has that vintage retro anime look that you've come to expect. But the one thing I appreciate uh, throughout the film, especially towards the end, is when they kind of play around with the um, jumping from location to location. And you have mild spoilers, of course. Mm-hmm. You have these portals that have this really sci fi aesthetic to it where it was completely it was something that i'm really not used to seeing from a ghibli film and just to see that contrast of oh this is what a the take on sci-fi would be again these are really small sections of the movie um they last only a few sections but it's so such a contrast to what i've seen from ghibli films essentially this whole past year that I really appreciated something different in that regard. Um, But throughout the movie, we did get, you know, the same whimsical imagery that you're used to seeing from these sorts of films. But at the same time, there are certain scenes that I would say were a bit disturbing in a way. Um, Slight spoilers. I think the two in particular are, there's this one scene where the protagonist, um, Mihito, is looking at the heron in the ocean and or in the lake, and the heron's inviting him to come with him. 
where a bunch of frogs and different animals emerge from the lake and start kind of climbing over the protagonist, Mihito. And I think that scene in particular just gave me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> um, with the gray heron, there are the scenes where um, his his mouth opens and you can kind of see uh, his teeth. Oh. I think those <laughs> scenes in particular uh, gave me the heebie-jeebies as well, where, you know, you still have a lot of the whimsical, but you also uh-huh. have the... Not... Because... Matt, would you say with something like Howl's Moving Castle, there was this grime to it. Um, There were some, especially like the castle itself, Mm -hmm. there are some grungy, quote unquote, disturbing parts of it. Uh, I think even that doesn't compare to some of the questionable scenes of the boy and the heron. But uh, overall, again, I liked the visuals. Um, production is still on point. Matt Miyazaki still has it in 2023, but uh-huh. at the same time, now that I'm a lot older, I think the story itself wasn't the strongest. I think there was parts where I was notably confused about what was ha- not only what was happening, but also some of the character motivations uh, and actions that seem to be brushed off by the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in one part in particular, uh, we have Natsuko, uh, who is the mother figure of the movie. Uh, she lashes out at Mihito. And I don't think the lashing out is the reason why she felt that resentment is ever explained. And especially towards the end where they kind of patch up everything relatively quick. Um, yeah, I think there are points like that, that you have these characters who are depicted to be saying one thing and, you know, talking about the consequences of actions. But in the next scene, those consequences don't really seem to matter. And there's like a new set of consequences to deal with, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But Again, I think the story isn't the strongest. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of allegory and analysis and symbolism that just flew over my head because, Matt, not going to lie, mm-hmm. I didn't have an afternoon coffee and I almost <laughs> fell asleep like twice during the movie, yeah. during the slow parts. But um, when it did pick up, when it does have the visuals, um, I know I keep going back to that, but that's really what I enjoyed. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I we did go to the dubbed version. I think uh, okay. I wouldn't mind going to see the subbed version, but the reason we stuck with the dubbed version is the tickets for that went on sale first. Mm-hmm. And Matt, not gonna lie, mm-hmm. we have to support Tito Dave. Matt, <laughs> uh-huh. As people in our middle ages who, or I mean, mid thirties who haven't hasn't met the man, Matt, uh-huh. is it Tito Dave or Kuya Dave? I mean, I Jaren, I don't know how old Dave Batista is. Matt, like, uh huh. There's only one way to figure this out because I'm looking at the Wikipedia, so I can click his name. And Tito Dave is 54. Oh, Jaren, that's like that border of like it depends on how you grew up with them, hmm. right? Like, does he right. does he eat at the <laughs> the table with you, or does he eat at the table with your <laughs> with your parents? Point taken, Matt. Point taken. I think. Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. if I ever met Dave Batista, I'm pretty sure I just call him Mr. Batista because yeah, <laughs> um, but, but, this is actually a pretty like wild cast. I'm looking at yeah. like, the cast right now. It's actually pretty good. So we have Robert Patterson who does the Gray Heron. We have oh. Christian Bale who plays the father figure. We have Mark Hamill who does the Grand Uncle. Of course, Tito Dave doing the Parakeet King, and Matt. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, Grand Uncle, uh, the father figure, even the parakeet king, as much as this is a star studded cast, and I think the voice acting is what you kind of expect from, you know, a Ghibli film, a dubbed Ghibli film. Like, uh-huh. I didn't think any of the performances were bad. Of course, you know, Mark Hamill, expert voice actor at this point, so mm-hmm. nothing wrong with there. Um a lot of their speaking lines, it, it's not a dialogue heavy film when it comes to these big stars, essentially. Like, uh-huh. of course, you know, Mojito 
And Natsuko and um, Kuriko, they have a lot more lines. But again, if you were going for maybe, and of course, Robert Patterson does too. But, mm-hmm. you know, someone like a Christian Bale, someone like a Mark Hamill, someone with a Dave Batista, it's only a handful of lines throughout, especially towards the end in itself. But yeah, still recommend it. Um, really great visually. I do like kind of the contrast in certain scenes but at the end of the day i think you know what you're getting into if you see a ghibli miyazaki film in 2023 Uh um and i think by the end of it i was more i was looking forward to read all the different interpretations of what people saw but Mm -hmm. other than that enjoyable experience i do recommend i i know our test was if we enjoyed it enough we would go see the subdiversion and i i think this is a film where i wouldn't mind going to see the uh, subdiversion especially in imax um matt speaking of imax before we move on from the movie corner uh uh, did you see godzilla minus one or do you have any intention to um i don't really have any intention to see it in theaters i if anything i'm probably gonna watch it once it uh comes digital or like online somewhere Okay, I I think it's only available in IMAX, so that's one of the reasons why I kind of want to check it out. But mm-hmm. as I was telling our... What is in 40X, Jared? Is it in 40X? I don't... Matt? <laughs> okay, when, when I'm in the area for uh, the Christmas holiday, mm-hmm. not only do we need to find time to kind of record something, hopefully, but Matt, let's try to see a 40X movie, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm down. Jared, okay. I'm watching the trailer for Boy and the Heron. And I, I see the birds, the heron's teeth. I don't like this. I don't like it. I think, okay, I also saw the frog scene. The frog scene actually looks kind of like cool to me. But mm-hmm. I think animals having human teeth is one of my like big icks. <laughs> Matt, be, explain why the heron has teeth. And I think when you realize why the heron has teeth, there are some scenes that lead up to the reveal. It's that, it's the lead up to the reveal um that is really questionable too and some really questionable scenes there so uh-huh uh yeah again what what more can i say matt i think if you're a fan of ghibli films you'll most likely be a fan of this but check it out mm-hmm. if you want something to watch um n- i'm not sure if it's available in 4dx <laughs> yeah. so jaren i mean i this is the episode's kind of like you know getting to the kind of long point, but before we, you know, get off of it, I kind of want to talk about the TGAs that happened last week. Okay. Matt? Mm-hmm. You mean uh, Jeff Keighley's The Game Awards 2023? Mm-hmm. 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 Featuring a segment for Hideo Kojima. Mm-hmm. And this this time featuring uh, Jordan Peele, which was honestly kind of wild for me to see. Matt, that, that... I know there's a lot of discourse going on to about... Uh, just how the show was produced, which we mm-hmm. won't really go into, but having that chunk of you know the show dedicated to Hideo Kojima and Jordan Peele, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I love me some Jeff Keighley, but m- maybe for twenty twenty four, maybe Mister Keighley can <laughs> dial it back just a bit, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. a bit. Uh-huh. But if there is one thing that the Game Awards have become known for it's all the announcements all the new trailers and that Mm -hmm. there were a few trailers that caught our attention definitely yes gotta ask you matt Mm -hmm. what caught your attention specifically i think one of the ones that caught my attention is uh mecha break i don't know if you watch this one jaren but it looks a lot like what i think i wanted armored core to be which is basically virtual on (laughs) Jared, the mech design in this looks very Gundam-y, looks very virtual on. The control style looks very virtual on me to me. And I don't know, something about it seems very satisfying to watch. And it looks far more like a, I don't know, anime mech game than uh, Armored Core was, which is why it's it's really interesting to me. Okay. Matt, mm-hmm. I know Armored Core 6 is definitely something that I want to kind of get back to. Yeah. But... In terms of scratching my anime mech itch, I think I am looking for something that is a bit more kind of easygoing, something I can really shut off my brain, customize a mech, and take it around town. 
that I still want that power fantasy. You mm-hmm. know me. I'm mm-hmm. a baby when mm-hmm. it comes to video games. So mm-hmm. hopefully this scratches that itch as well. Yeah. Sharon, another game that caught my attention because I had just... I feel like I just totally forgot about this game. Or maybe I'm mixing it up with another game. But it's Stormgate. I don't know if you know what this game is, Jaren. Matt, mm-hmm. I'm not feeling that name because... Oh, that's, a bad, yeah, that's a bad name. <laughs> the name Stormgate, I think, oh, hasn't this game come out already and been rebooted already? Just because that that's that's the feeling I get from a name like Stormgate. But mm-hmm. what is it? Jaren, it's an RTS game, hmm. which surprises me because I feel like I haven't seen an RTS in a really long time, especially one that has enough of an advertising budget to advertise on the VGAs. Yeah. Oh, is that the one with Simu Lee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Uh, that's the one with our our, our boy Shang-Chi. And, oh, man, Canadian boy. Uh-huh. So. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Jen, I, I don't know. It. This game looks like an RTS. Like, this is an RTS rts as rts game and while i did enjoy my time with starcraft i and i could just go back to starcraft because like i'm sure that's still a very valid game this game is like really scratching uh i want to try this but i also know i'm only gonna play it for like like maybe five hours and I don't know if I really want to uh, go go deep on it. Or not. Nothing, nothing, not that I'm saying that like this game looks bad. I'm just saying that like RTS is one of those genres that I like a lot in concept, but in practice always fall flat for me because I don't have the mechanical expertise to operate them properly. Fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. And Matt? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Simu Liu, not <laughs> Simu Li. I am an awful person. <laughs> Jaren, I think another one that I want to uh, just like touch on real quick is Windblown, which is, I think it's a co-op kind of, um, I don't know how to describe this kind of game anymore. Jaren, do you remember Spiral Knights? Yes. It's that kind of like action game, but it's um, being made by the people who did Dead Cells, which is giving me like a lot of hope that this is going to be a good like playing game and the fact that it looks co-op makes it seem like a lot more interesting okay at mm-hmm. spiral nights has a special place in my heart because i think when steam came to mac mm-hmm. you you me and julian that was one of the first games i played uh on my macbook uh-huh and you know i love me some dead cells so i think i'll keep an eye out on this but uh-huh. Not not sure how much I want to kind of dedicate to a yeah. new Spiral Knights. Jaren, I, I I think I'm gonna put some time into this because Jer- I I really like Spiral Knights. Jaren, I think Spiral Knights was the first game I ever like bought microtransactions into, mm-hmm. and I don't know something about that makes me feel like I need to <laughs> commit to this sort of game. Right, right, right. But um. Another trailer that uh, I want to talk about quickly is Kamuri. Matt, Mm -hmm. I didn't know that this was from Ikumi Nakamura. And I think, Matt, Mm -hmm. I know I watched this trailer before the show. Mm -hmm. And I think with Kamuri, aesthetically... The trailer, all the art, um, all the, you know, just everything I've seen released of this game so far Mm -hmm. looks right up my alley. Yes. I think just seeing how the characters look, the free running, the combat, and the fact that, you know, you become a yokai hunter and it's this blend that it's this blend of traditional Japanese folklore and that, you know, urban city environment, like aesthetic that. Mm -hmm. I've said on the show time and time before, Mm -hmm. I'm really into. Matt, Mm -hmm. I desperately want to know how this plays. Yeah, Sam. When I watch this trailer, I think it's it does everything right visually for me, but Mm -hmm. it's 
I don't know how to explain this, but it, as cool as this looks, for some reason, it also gives me the vibe of this will probably play like something I don't like, if that makes sense. Jeremy, when I saw this trailer the first time, I think my initial thought was something along the lines of, oh, this is what I wanted Sunset Overdrive to be. Yes. Okay. I can see that. And I don't know. It, Conceptually, it does look very interesting to me, and I, I hope that it plays well where i think one of my biggest concerns especially with the trailer was oh is this you know a hero shooter you know a hero pvp type game but you know with i know ikumi nakamura um how when she was tied to ghostwire tokyo Mm -hmm. um now like i think the same connection is in my mind of, oh, is this what Ghostwire Tokyo could have been, if that makes sense as well? Mm -hmm. Where, I don't know. And I I think that ending shot of, oh, it was a group of, what, five or six yokai hunters facing, like, looking into a sky of, like, yokai. I also hope that this isn't a... Matt, this is going to be awful. I don't want it to be a competitive PvP game. I don't want it to be a hunt like a Monster Hunter game. Uh, I'm like I don't know what I want this to be. Okay, I do want to know what I want this to be. Solid free r- running, uh, cool parkour, and I don't know maybe plays like a platinum game. Uh huh. But with maybe with co op, but you know me, Matt. I hate playing with people. If you're down to play, I'll play. But. Uh-huh. I'm really curious what this actually is, just because on their official website right now, there's a press kit, there's a store, there's a Discord. Nothing really get telling me about the gameplay. Um, I'm kind of hoping it's a horde type game. To be honest, no, that could be cool. Like man, the art's so cool. Like mm-hmm. again, I this is everything aesthetically I want out of a game, and that's why I'm so I'm dreading that eventually it will just become something that either doesn't play well or something I just doesn't feel great. And Mm -hmm. I'm really hoping it doesn't go that way because it has so much style. I want to be really anticipated for this, Matt, Uh at the same time. I need to know how it plays like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matt, I'm so negative on this show. (laughs) Why can't I be hyped for something? Yeah. I mean, Jaren, you 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 shouldn't get hyped for things because uh, one thing I got hyped for that uh, played was uh, Monster Hunter Wilds, that yes. trailer finally dropping, and then the very end of that trailer, them saying twenty twenty five, and now, I what thought comes that, out first, Grand Theft Auto Six or Monster Hunter Wilds? I uh I don't know. I I feel like twenty twenty five is not a hard date for uh, Monster game. Hunter. That's, okay, fair um, enough. But also like. Jaren, I actually, one thing I really liked about the Monster Hunter Wilds uh, trailer drop, specifically for the Game Awards, is that after the trailer played, uh, Jeff Keighley was just trying to get so much information out of, um, I can't remember his name, one of the lead dev, the lead dev for uh, Monster Hunter, and he was just not dropping anything new. And the fact yeah. that it, he was also speaking in Japanese, so you had to wait for the translator to drop <laughs> the information that we just saw in the trailer was, uh, I don't know, that was a good goof. But, Good uh, goof, yeah. but yeah, we'll, we're bound to get more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, so. Jaren, I think the thing that really stood out to me, or one of the two things, I guess, that stood out to me the most is the Light No Fire uh, trailer. Yes. Which is the new game by the No Man's Sky devs. And this game is basically... it's. A fantasy ver like timeline of a, uh, I guess like kind of following like No Man's Sky's kind of a uh, system where it's just an ever expanding thing, but instead of it being a whole universe, it's one singular world. And on one hand, the game itself looks interesting to me, but the way that they were kind of talking about this game makes me very iffy to play it because they were so hard emphasizing it's like a huge singular world for every like everybody to explore and the way that they were talking about it made it seem like it is actually one singular world that every single player is going to be 
sharing on. And Jared, I don't like that as a concept. Hmm. Where what don't you like? Like, what about that doesn't appeal to you, man? Something about just not like. I would expect this kind of game to be a server-based game or something right. like that, where if you find a cool spot, you're free to build there. The idea that one, you, if you find like a cool spot and somebody got somebody else got there first, it it sucks because now okay, there's like somebody somebody there. Two, it looks like a survival game. So now you're also going to be competing with real resources with another real ass person, which kind of sucks. And three, I don't think that this would be in it, but I'm worried that it's going to have the kind of rust issue where mm. if you're not online, you're losing stuff to other people. And right. I don't like having that kind of like thought process going on in the back of my head when I'm not playing the game. I wonder if there will be an offline mode or some sort of equivalent where mm-hmm. I think with the redemption arc that No Man's Sky has gone through, I wonder if the team will be more conscious of kind of options and things that, you know, since No Man's Sky has been, you know, this love letter to its community constantly supported, I wonder if any... I'd be so curious to just see any developer insight of what they're taking from No Man's Sky and applying to this game. Mm -hmm. And even kind of that player sentiment and how much, you know, fan requested features or updates or quality of life changes uh, that go into a No Man's Sky, how much of it would go into this. I think for me personally, Matt, I find the development of this game a lot more interesting uh, Mm -hmm. than me playing the game itself. Where, yeah, I don't know, Matt. I think I'm also just confused what this game is because a lot of the time I've seen people discuss this trailer and the game behind it, it's the notion of, oh, you spent all this time climbing a mountain only to find out, wait, the guy (laughs) off in the distance, he climbed a higher mountain than me. And I think that notion undersells it completely. But at the same time, it makes me go, wait, what? what is this game? Are we just claiming molotons at this point? But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know, Matt. I don't know. Could be cool, though. But I think the development of this game is something that I want to see. Mm-hmm. And Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about kind of developers with not necessarily storied history, but kind of infamous history at this point now, mm-hmm. Uh now we got to look at Marvel's Blade uh, uh-huh. being developed by Arcane, which is, I think it's the Arcane that did Deathloop and Dishonored 2. And mm-hmm. I think it's kind of interesting, at least, that Arc- an Arcane studio is delivering us another vampire year killing mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. Just when earlier this year we had Arcane also delivering us a vampire killing experience with Redfall. Mm-hmm. And I know we have the Arcane behind Death Loop and Dishonored 2 here. Uh Matt, mm-hmm. this was a cinematic trailer. I think it got the vibes right. I'm just really curious to see how it plays. And Matt, mm-hmm. over under do you think when this game ultimately releases, there's going to be digs at Redfall in it? Uh, one hundred, yeah, one hundred percent. I think there's going to be Redfall digs in there. Okay, Matt. Uh-huh. Second question: Is mm-hmm. this exclusive to Xbox? You think? Oh, I don't even consider that. You would th- well, I guess with the Sony license, Spider-Man is exclusive to the PlayStation Five. Where mm-hmm. if this is under the Bethesda umbrella, I think a lot of the nothing was confirmed so far, but I think there were a lot of hints that it might be Xbox exclusive. Oh, um, I see. If, you know, coming from the studio that did Death Loop and Dishonored 2, Matt, what would Blade need to do to make you want to check it out? Jaren, I don't know if there's really anything that would make me want to check it out. Because, mm-hmm. like, I personally don't really have too much of an attachment to the Blade franchise. And when I think about what the Blade like the i guess like the optimal blade game could be in my head it's something very similar to witcher 3 right and witcher 3 isn't something that like 
jived with me particularly well. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know what I would want out of a Blade franchise to make me want to play a Blade game. All right. Fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. But Matt, Mm -hmm. if something like a Blade can't it doesn't interest you could i offer a power surge from <laughs> sega matt uh-huh we gotta look at you know games coming in the i don't know it was called the power surge i think this is part of um sega's new initiative or at least the first wave of what they're calling their kind of next initiative of games mm-hmm. and i know that they specifically said that you know, their IP revivals are just the start of what they want to do. And when they were talking to the Washington Post, um, they said that, you know, they want this new wave of games, which includes Jet Set Radio, Streets of Rage, Golden Axe, Shinobi, and Crazy Taxi to kind of be modernized and have this rebellious spirit to them. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. With this grab bag of new games, our first look at a new Jet Set Radio, uh, essentially a 3D Streets of Rage, a Golden Axe, a 2D Shinobi, and you know, Crazy Taxi. Matt, mm-hmm. did these do anything for you? I mean, Jaren, of course, the Jet Set Radio one really caught my eye because I mm-hmm. was very confused at what I was seeing. Yeah, because I thought it was a Jaren. I honestly thought it was a joke. <laughs> really. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. I thought maybe, oh, is this a new Jet Set Radio? Or is this maybe, you know, they're just doing Jet Set Radio original, but they're remastering it. And it seems like it's a new game. Like, that's the that's what they said, right? Yeah, it's a new game. Yeah, so I'm, I'm like, really excited to see where Jet Set Radio is going to go. And especially, I, I'm interested in seeing what the end more is going to be. Hmm. Because I feel okay. like there's, I don't know, a couple of things in there that I, I think I would want to see. Okay. Matt, Jaren, I just want Altered Beast. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. As some, I know you're a big fan of Mark of the Ninja. Mm-hmm. Uh, did the Shinobi stuff do anything for you? Oh, you know what, Jaren? I saw the Shinobi gameplay. I never actually considered if it would play like Mark of the Ninja. Because... Maybe I'm just misremembering this, Jeremy, but I, I remember Shinobi being a lot more action-y, but maybe yeah. I'm just thinking of the wrong game. No, I don't think Shinobi was a lot more action-y compared to Mark of the Ninja, but mm-hmm. hey, who knows if you're, they're trying to modernize something. Matt, does Crazy Taxi work in 2023 still? I mean, I think it could. Jaren, I'll be honest, I never owned Crazy Taxi. For me, Crazy Taxi was one of those um, games that I played at my cousin's house. Same. For same like, yeah. Yeah. For like a, you know, five minute window and then I'd lose and then, you know, we'd do the controller pass off. Yep. So I, I'm curious to see what uh, Crazy Taxi is going to be in 2023, probably 2024, actually. Matt, are they going to bring back Vector Man? Jared, I was thinking about Vector Man. I, that would be a cool thing to bring back. I don't know if it <laughs> hangs right now, right. but Fair I enough. would like to see a new Vector Man. Okay. Matt? Mm-hmm. Was there anything that else you did see at the Game Awards that you wanted to mention? I think that that might be it. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think that's it, Jaren. Uh, all right. They showed more metaphor refantasio, Jaren. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to playing uh, half of that game <laughs> and then <laughs> and then burning out on it. Oh man, Matt. You know what? Same. Mm-hmm. Same, man. Mm-hmm. I am also looking forward to playing half of that game. Um, but... same, same thing, exactly, for uh, Visions of Mana and probably Black Myth Wukong. <laughs> Matt, I, mm-hmm. sh- I sure love starting a lot of games uh-huh. and not finishing them. Mm-hmm. I think that's become a favorite pastime of mine. Mm-hmm. Just like recording another episode of The Mistake <laughs> Zone with one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Mm-hmm. Hey, Matt. Mm-hmm. I want to thank you, as always, for joining me this week and editing this. I was going to say fine, fine, but I think one fine will suffice. This fine podding experience. Jaren, I want to thank you for bringing to my attention that um, (laughs) there's there's herons out there with teeth. Oh, man. We need to look out for them, Matt. They're they're Mm -hmm. dangerous Uh apex predators. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to thank Fort. 
I want to thank mm-hmm. Knight. I think I want to thank The Weeknd? Question mark. <laughs> I want to thank <laughs> Harmonix. I want to thank Boys. I want to thank Herons without teeth. You know what? I want to thank Boys and Girls and everyone in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to thank the Dorito Pope and the Mountain Dew Pope. Mm-hmm. And I also had, I also hope that Chimera is a good game. <laughs> I desperately want that to be a good game. Oh man, uh, oh, man. Not- Jaren. <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm closing my the tabs that I've opened as uh, we've we've talked about this show or done this episode, and I just noticed that uh, Dave Bautista was born in 1969. Nice, 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 nice. 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 <laughs> Jaren, I want to thank Tito Dave. <laughs> oh man, Jaren, can you believe that out there there are just people who have the real birthday of 42069? <laughs> Matt, uh-huh. I know exactly what I'm Googling after <laughs> I say peace to you after this episode. Oh, man. But Matt, mm-hmm. please take it away. This has been The Mistake Zone, and we're all out of birds with teeth. <laughs>